Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Ted Warburton, Interim Dean of the Arts Division at UC Santa Cruz, and I thank you for joining us. Like you, we in the arts welcome this opportunity to support the Institute of the Arts and Sciences Initiative on Art, Prisons, and Justice. This multifaceted initiative includes Barring Freedom, an exhibition that opens at the San Jose Museum of Art on October 30th, and Solitary Garden, a public art project on our campus undertaken in collaboration with the Mary Porter Cessna Art Gallery. We are delighted to partner with the San Jose Museum and Cessna Gallery, and we're grateful for their support. And of course, we have today's event with professors Angela Davis and Gina Dent, which launches a series of online conversations on the theme, Visualizing Abolition. This year long programming reflects our commitment to the creative potential of the arts to be in dialogue with the crucial issues of our time, enriching and deepening our understanding of the histories and institutional structures that have sowed inequality in our nation. Rachel Nelson, director of the Institute of the Arts and Sciences and her collaborators, Alexandra Moore, co-curator of Barring Freedom, and Professor Gina Dent, who not only joins us tonight, but who has been essential in planning visualiz visualizing abolition, have worked closely together to embody in this exhibition our shared commitment to social justice and anti-racist education. In a historical moment filled with uncertainty and turmoil, we are grateful to be in conversation with such creative visionaries, including artists, musicians, scholars, and activists who will gather throughout the year in various exhibitions and events. So thank you, Rachel, Alexandra, and Gina, and thank you to everyone who is contributing to this phenomenal year of programming for the arts at UC Santa Cruz. Rachel, I'll turn it over to you now. Hi, everyone. As Ted said, I'm Rachel Nelson, director of UC Santa Cruz Institute of the Arts and Sciences. And I'm gonna really try to spare everyone who's clicked in on a long introduction about this gathering. The motivation for our academic year-long initiative into art, prisons, policing, and abolition, which launches today, is very much rooted in the amazing work of anti-prison activists, scholars, and educators, Angela Davis and Gina Dent, who are joining us in a moment. I think over the course of this conversation about the functions of art, music, visual culture, and the radical imaginary within abolitionist methodologies, the larger project that's underway will start to come into focus. And everyone here today certainly knows of Professor Dent and Professor Davis's exemplary history of scholarship and activism. So I'll spare us the extended introductory remarks. I will also say that if I were to start thanking all the people and organizations that contributed to this exhibition and event series, we would be here for a very long time staring at our computer screens. So instead I'll stress that abolitionist approaches to social change emphasize always collaboration and partnership. And from Alexandra Moore, the co-curator of, of Barring Freedom, to Lauren Dickens at San Jose Museum of Art, and Shelby Graham and Louise Leong at the Mary Porter Cessnon Gallery, to the artists who've hung in there with us through long years of planning and all the delays, to Tim Young, our collaborator in San Quentin State Prison, and all the people who'll be participating in future events who spent time brainstorming with, with us, to all the students, faculty, and others at UC Santa Cruz, UC Davis, Howard School of Law, and others who've joined us, and of course, to our music curator, the amazing Grammy award-winning Terry Lynn Carrington and everyone she's gotten involved to make music for abolition, a little of which we just experienced and stay tuned for more. Know how grateful, grateful we are for your contributions to this method of, of working, caring, and making. One more quick thing. This is a conversation and we will have some time for your questions. So please do enter them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. There's a lot of you here so I'm grateful to our friends in the, back, in the background that will be sorting through those questions and grouping them for content and themes. We look forward to getting through as many of them as possible. I also wanna note that this event is being closed captioned. So thanks for the hard work being done on that. And will be recorded and archived at barnfreedom.org, the website that's been created by Alexandra Moore and a team of graduate student education fellows, including Abram Stern, Aaron Malenga, as well as Chloe Murr. So without that out of the way, with as much brevity as I could accomplish, I'm so pleased to have the incredible Angela Davis and Gina Dent join us. Thank you so much for being here. It's so lovely to see you, if virtually, 
against the backdrop of the pandemic, civil unrest, and the election, of course, for a conversation on art, aesthetics, and abolition. It's always so wonderful to see both of you and to have opportunities to think with you. It's been an indescribable pleasure and really an honor to collaborate with you, Gina, over the last months in conceiving the Visualizing Abolition event series. We've assembled an amazing group of artists, scholars, and activists, and I look forward to all that will unfold. Today's only the beginning. And I'm also so, it's such a pleasure, I'm sorry, to, to, see, uh, to see you, Angela, and to actually be able to hear you when your words and your voice are so often in my head. Well, can I just say for one moment, I wanna thank you, Rachel. It's been amazing to work with you. Uh, your work as director of the Institute is, is really incredible. And um, I love the fact that this is a collaborative project. It really represents the best of abolition uh, work. And so I look forward to tonight and the whole year. Thanks so much. So, and as I've alluded to, really, not only have you been instrumental in, your pro in our programming, both you and Angela have been really the inspiration for creating the exhibition at San Jose Museum of Art and the larger initiative on art and abolition that the conversation, this conversation embarks us on. We are responding to your insistence here, even amid the urgency of the times that's driving many reactive responses. The sustained social change is a project of creative making and thinking. And Angela, your decades long history of anti-prison work and struggles for justice, and just to say the obvious, justice here does not fit within the paradigm of policing and prisons, have been central to our thinking. And it's also the attention you play to art, visual culture, and aesthetics that has made such an impression on what we are doing. When I was your student in a class in, on the Frankfurt School in critical theory some years ago, on the first day, Angela, when you realized there was a critical mass of graduate students in the room who were artists, filmmakers, who were writing on art and visual culture, you actually retooled the class to add a week on aesthetics and theory. That was a huge, of course, influence on me. And I would have to say that even before I went into that class, I knew you were committed to thinking about the realm of aesthetics and about perception in the sensorial, in part because of your book, Blues Legacies and Black Feminism. And as a visual studies scholar, I always say my copy of Our Prisons Absolute actually falls open on page 17, where you address how images had a key role in normalizing this nation's huge prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And actually you quote Gina right there, in pointing out how central to image culture in the US the prison has been, with the history of cinema creating, as Gina writes, a sense of its permanence as an institution. As I told Gina when I first asked her if she'd be interested in creating a project, a program on art and abolition, how she definitely points out not only to the problem of the images, but the history of visuality that's linked to prisons was really the place that the thinking started for this project. So this leads us to kind of the big question of where, where we are tonight that perhaps we can think of with you, Angela, about how the struggle for abolition relates to art, visual culture, and aesthetics. How do you think about your combined focus on aesthetics and abolition? Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Rachel, and everyone else involved in um, this program for inviting me to participate in this um, conversation. And, uh, I'm totally impressed by this um, monumental project that brings us this uh, phenomenal art exhibition, Barring Freedom, along with uh, a very long series of conversations around the topic of visualizing abolition. And of course, there's the phenomenal music by Terry Lynn Carrington. Uh, I also think I heard Nicholas Payton uh, in the opening uh, tune uh, uh, and, and and also the very moving sonic and oral experience that we will have, the music video that features Terry and Lisa Fisher. But let me say, um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for reminding me about that class on critical theory in the Frankfurt School. And I do remember uh, that uh, we decided to um, focus on um, aesthetics, uh, which played a really important role in um, the work of all of the uh, members of the Frankfurt School, virtually all. Philosophically, I find the realm of aesthetics and aesthetic theory to be an important starting point for thinking about how abolitionist approaches require us to uh, sort of shuttle between critiques of existing institutions and social realities, uh, um, both didactic and artistic critiques, and our imaginative evocations of new institutions and new social realities. Um, 
the institution of the prison, and I'm talking about jails, prisons, um, immigrant detention facilities with, with their concrete walls and barbed wire fences is supposed to visually communicate um, immutability and permanence. Uh, uh, and it actually takes a great feat of the imagination to remove these institutions, which have become so normalized that in seeing them, we don't see them. Uh, we kind of see them as background. We see them a part of, as a part of the framework that renders everything else normal. Uh, and so an important dimension of our struggle has first of all been to make prisons visible. Um, and, and, and of course, some of the artists in the exhibition, I'm thinking about Ashley Hunt and others uh, precisely do this uh, uh, for, but we make, we make it, we make them visible precisely for the purpose of removing um, them from our visual frames and from the larger society. Um, and, you know, I was thinking it's important to point out that we're not referring to a biological account of visuality, but, but rather to forms of visibility that are ideologically uh, determined. I like aesthetics because the field itself uh, reminds us that the forms of knowledge on which we most often depend are not the only forms of knowledge. Uh, uh, art and other practices that rely on the faculty of the imagination are not confined by a particular object of knowledge that supposedly remains stable, uh, but rather um, uh, things can be rearranged and reconstructed and reimagined. Uh, but um, just a few more words on this, uh, uh, because you asked me the question about which I could probably speak for the next hour. Uh, um, when I studied, when I first studied um, aesthetic theory, I was totally captivated by um, Kant's, Immanuel Kant's notion of sensus communis, uh, which allows for a kind of co collective imagination. Uh, and it, 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 it allows us to move beyond the individual and in thinking about our relations to art, uh, uh, the beautiful. Um, it's a kind of internalized sense of the communities we inhabit, which becomes apparent when we experience art uh, or engage in an experience that activates our imagination. Uh, so the, the, the whole notion of the imagination, not as individual or individualized, but rather as collective. Uh, and uh, I suppose I should stop here. <laughs> Otherwise we won't get through all of the questions. <laughs> I think that that's a, a great point. And one of the things that you're pointing to that I think is so, we're trying to so urgently respond to is that aesthetics and actually visuality isn't isn't about seeing like as you said it's the, not the biological it's how we're perceiving and understanding the world around us and the ways in which that's socially constructed that there's something that's um, that's already informing how we're doing that and that I think is Gina when you point to that when you say the word visuality you're pointing to those structures so I wondered if you could talk more about how you recognize how critical visuality would be in the struggles. Yeah, well, um, first of all, thank you. Um, and hello, everyone. This feels like a very intimate conversation. And then I forget that there are actually people watching us. So um, thank you so much for, for uh, starting us off this way. I just want to start by saying that I guess from the earliest time that I was involved as an activist and not actually doing research on this yet, I realized from uh, before Critical Resistance, but when Critical Resistance, the conference that took place in 1998 at UC Berkeley, but was actually generated at UC Santa Cruz, and maybe Angela will say more about that later, um, that conversation that led up to the conference really talked about the role that artists would play. I and mean, there was a lot of emphasis on needing to make sure that that conference would not just have cultural performers on the, you know, edges of what the important scholars were talking about, but that every panel had creatives a part of it if possible. Of course, people who, who were involved were also formerly incarcerated, sometimes currently incarcerated if it was possible, um, sometimes making art. 
So I realized that it was really important to have that art included, but also to not stop the thinking when we were talking about the art. So it isn't just sort of just any art, but really what is the way that we prepare ourselves to learn to think with that art? How does pausing with that work really help us? And part of the reason that felt so necessary to me is that a lot of times in the activist world, we were focused on getting more and more information out about what was wrong with incarceration. But it seemed to me that there was a surfeit of information from virtually every political stripe about what was wrong with incarceration. And yet we weren't getting anywhere. We weren't getting any traction about abolition. So then I started to think, well, what secures the knowledge that the criminal justice system is producing in all of us? And I've been interested throughout my career in popular culture, and I became more and more interested in the visual culture and realizing that people were taking it in and using it to make assessments about what the future should be or what we could do about prisons. And also were resigning themselves to having them in our landscapes, partly because of our immersion in that popular visual field, but also the lack of discussion about it. So not having a sense that that work was affecting us was making it even more effective. So what does it mean to look at artists to help us to slow down, to um, do what philosophers help us do, to help us think precisely, to take time and manage it differently. And I have felt ever since then that it was really important to talk about all of the artwork that was being produced and that some of that is popular work, some of that is fictional. I think a, a lot of work has been focused on documentary, but I think a lot of the fictional work is really important because of the way that it, that it actually affects as what Angela was talking about from Kant, the, the idea of, of how we, we internalize um, that community. You know, it's interesting because you're saying, you know, talking about the ways that you're approaching this in 1998 and Angela mentioned part of the issues of how the prisons have operated is they've managed to recede from site, that they're largely haven't been visible, that people who are uh, incarcerated, you know, disappear, that there's this ways in which that works. And I know that that was a lot of what, how you focused your work on the prison Angela and how the movement focused its work, not just you as an individual, was thinking about how to bring that into sight instead of paying attention, for instance, to the bad cops and the kind of racist actors within, you know, policing, court systems, all of that. So I was wondering how you kind of go back and think about that now. Do you think people are more aware of the prison system? And then how do you think now the relationship is evolving between abolition and the calls of defunding the police? Hmm. That's um, an interesting question, um, Rachel. Um, and as I look back, I don't necessarily think that we chose to highlight prisons over the police, but rather uh, we've always been attempting to grasp their connectedness. So, I mean, it's very interesting that as abolition has rapidly moved into the mainstream far more quickly than any of us who've been working on abolition could ever have imagined. Um, it has been largely in relation to the immediate demands following the um, state lynching of uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis and of course the murder of Breonna Taylor in, in Louisville. Um, but if one looks at the long history of struggles against the police, uh, uh, and campaigns against police violence, uh, uh, racist police violence, uh, uh, go much further back uh, than mass movements uh, against uh, prisons. If one looks at the history of those struggles, including their role in enabling and carrying out lynching, uh, if one goes back to the opposition to slave patrols um, and slave catchers under the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, uh, there's always been an implicit demand to abolish uh, the police. 
even when we did not realize that that is what we wanted. I can remember extended arguments uh, regarding police review boards uh, when many of us pointed out that a civilian review board simply implied that the police would continue to engage in that racist and repressive uh, behavior, except that there would be a review board uh, uh, to um, uh, um, review them. And then there were those who called for community control rather than community review, which was a kind of, which was a way of kind of retaining, but simultaneously beginning to envision uh, the evolution of, of, of the police. Uh, but also as, um, as new formations, I'm thinking about the organization Insight, uh, Women of Color Against Violence, which interestingly enough, also had its um, origin on the campus of UC Santa Cruz uh, uh, as, as um, Insight began to develop and other formations focused on eliminating gender violence. Uh, uh, they expressly called upon us to imagine different ways of addressing uh, gender violence, the most pandemic form of violence in the world, ways that did not rely on the police. Uh, and so um, uh, abolitionist praxis has uh, from the very outset involved the creation of police-free zones. Uh, and um, of course the emergence of restorative justice, transformative justice uh, has also helped us to see this connection. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's such an interesting because, of course, it feels like there's this moment where so many people are paying attention to all the work that's been done and building on it. And it's a really exciting moment to be in to see that all this momentum and what we can possibly do with it. And I know, Gina, that one of the things that you and I have talked about a lot is what is it to think about art in this time and actually to have conversations about art and creative practices in this time. I mean, it's been a incredibly challenging moments that we've met in that we've talked about this, whether it's, you know, watching our friends on the inside have, you know, yeah. deal with the consequences of COVID, the wildfires that have, you know, ravaged our communities. I mean, our collaborator, Tim Young got sick in San Quentin and really thinking about the roles of art. So I'd love to have you talk about art and cultural production in these kind of urgent times. Mm. This sounds a little bit like the why art question. <laughs> like when people ask, you know, um, with all the urgent issues of the day, you know, why should we be going to museums and why should we be um, doing things that are that appear to be distractions? I mean, I, I actually think fortunately, and I really would say that, especially since Black Lives Matters uh, got started, uh, uh, we started to pay even closer attention to culture. Um, I think back to when I used to have to argue a lot because the term prison culture was a term used to refer to what people inside were doing. And it was always a, a violent description of their behavior. And it was really for a long time, I rolled to point out that prison culture was the culture created by the state and that we should be looking at um, what is invisibilized in our gaze in that way. But the other side of, of all of this is the way that art has um, been uh, something that we sometimes neglected to take seriously. And I think in the last some years, it's not surprising that uh, exhibitions like Barring Freedom, which you and Alexandra Moore have organized, but also um, Marking Time, which Nicole Fleetwood, one of our collaborators has organized and um, uh, Walls Turned Sideways and so many other um, ex exhibitions that I may not even know about are, are there because we're realizing that we can't leave all of those spaces alone, that those are spaces where we really need to be um, creating new forms of knowledge. And so I don't think of, uh, I never have thought of, but I think more and more people don't think of, of studying art practice and looking at the work of artists as something you do after you understand better. I think we're, we're understanding more and more what it means to have an embodied sense of knowledge. Uh, it's a feminist understanding. I think it's not coincidental that BLM 
was begun by three feminists and that even though we forget that and sometimes we disappear that, that that feeling is in the relationship to thinking about culture. And so art is a really important part of that and visual art in particular. And I'm loving the way that visual artists are, um, as, as Sanford Biggers puts it, you know, collaborating with the past, uh, really helping us to think, think with the past and, and not just uh, illustrating what scholars have written, which is sort of my least favorite way of thinking about what artists are doing, um, but instead really uh, collaborating with us, communicating across different modalities and um, building our capacity to, to see and to think about the world that we're in uh, in, a, in a new way. And, and also, I think that they're helping us to recognize how to have an abolitionist aesthetics, which doesn't only mean about a future when we no longer have prisons, but actually being able to review the entire history of our visuality in a way that allows us to reframe it uh, and to see it again. Um, this is from, from things that are as present in the streets as uh, taking down monuments and reconsidering what the public monument means to um, exhibitions like Barring Freedom, which are really asking people to understand art practice, to understand why taking, for example, the materials made inside uh, prisons like Sharon Daniel has done, our colleague at UC Santa Cruz, taking flags that have been made by prisoners uh, inside and using those as um, the substance of and the material for the artwork and letting us see the prison industrial complex in that way, in a way that helps people understand it um, as less than uh, abstract, I think in the way that they often receive that information. And you could tell, I could go on and on about that question too. <laughs> well, and it actually, I think makes me have a question uh, that can bring Angela back in, I'm kind of thinking about it as I go along with this notion of abolitionist aesthetics. I mean, because I think that there's a lot of ways, we have tons and tons of images of, as we've mentioned already in this conversation, actually of prisons and policing. And they're uh, ubiquitous in our society. And they're, as you said, part of what has naturalized it. So I'm wondering about, you know, that fine line that imagery can take to actually reinscribe the systems, to help us normalize it, to reinforce this um, ideas of racism, right, and criminality that it, how it attaches to people's bodies. Mm -hmm. So I thought that maybe you could talk a little bit more about this and what do you think about this kind of abolitionist aesthetics and how we're moving between these different kinds of images? You know what? I, I know this is a bit of a cheat, but we were going to show and preview a video by Terry Lynn Carrington and Lisa Fisher. Uh, and the video is called Us and We. And I'm going to take the liberty of asking us to do a little preview now. I know we're going to play it at the end of the um, evening tonight, um, but I'd like to um, have us watch maybe a little bit of Us and We.
That was amazing, if not quite as smooth as we could have wanted. <laughs> I was just thinking that artists are going to make a next level Zoom platform and yes. then we'll be able to collaborate much in real time. Uh, improvisation is not yet uh, available to us on the Zoom. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the point is, and we're all gonna be able to enjoy it later. I, I wanna talk a minute about it. Um, that was composed, performed in film by Terry Lynn Carrington and Lisa Fisher. And it was edited by Yo V. And um, they describe it as a piece examining issues of isolation, mental illness, grieving, profiling, spiritual well being, love, freedom, and their relationship to incarceration. But the reason I wanted to just hear it and, and hopefully see it um, is that I wanted us to start to think about how those issues sound before we actually experience them through the music and through the visuals that they created. And I have to say, I'm so impressed at what you're able to create um, uh, Terry and Lisa through uh, in, this, in this time when people are not filming uh, in the conventional ways. But, you know, there's so many themes that are um, picked up here. If you just look at um, uh, Terry's um, um, instruments and yet there are, it could be a weapon, but suddenly it turns into something else. There's the, hoodie that, um, that reminds us of Trayvon. And so all of these things, as we're taking through the video really are transformed for us. And I think it's that experience that we as teachers and as scholars often want to create for the people who listen to us. And yet here we can compress it in such a way that we can allow people to break it down and see it more clearly. And, and we'll get to more of that I know later, but I, I thought just because you asked that it would be a good place to, to begin to introduce it. And I know we're gonna have so many other incredible musicians um, working with us this uh, year. I mean, we have Cecile mclaurin Salmon who just won the uh, MacArthur, Diane Reeves, Jason Moran, Oren Evans, Eric Rivas, Nicholas Payton, Terry Lynn Carrington's band, Social Science, Nicole Mitchell, Malcolm Jamal Warner. I wanted to say that because I wanted to talk about how many people are willing to work now collaboratively on projects that will not yield incredible amounts of money, but are really about using everything they have toward this struggle. And it is that collaboration that is really exciting me in this, in this moment. And to see, as Angela pointed out, after these decades, that everyone really understands we need to go somewhere and we need to try to figure out together how to get there. It is a really exciting time. Angela? It, yeah, and actually um, I think that it was um, a really good that we saw the video after you asked the question uh, <laughs> about, the, um, about the proliferation of images uh, of, of, of uh, imprisonment and uh, policing. And, and I, I, I would, in, in answering that question, I would uh, begin by saying that, um, that um, these questions are always complicated because our ways of seeing are not necessarily dictated by the object of our vision. No. <laughs> uh, and it occurred to me that in watching the video uh, that the way in which the visual, the video was contextualizes uh, um, encourage us, encourages us to interpret the images uh, in certain ways. Uh, we often see differently and more critically based on the generation of new ideas, new intellectual and activist and visual environments and sonic environments, especially sonic environments. The image, um, images by themselves are not self-evident and self-explanatory regardless of the fact that people often say, well, if we only show the violence to people, they will act. 
but we know that that has never happened. Uh, the case of Rodney King uh, is perhaps the prime example of that, uh, that the jury got to see every single moment of the beating and uh, was led to the uh, conclusion that it was Rodney King uh, who was at fault. Uh, um, the, um, and and, and I, I guess I should say that precisely when images begin to appear self-evident, that is when we need to question uh, um, how that um, putatively self-evident quality has been um, yeah. constructed. Uh, so um, in, in organizing the first conference of uh, critical resistance, um, critical resistance beyond the prison industrial complex, 1998, Gina referred to it. Uh, uh, it was um, actually conceived on the campus uh, at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, um, um, Cassandra Shaler, who was a graduate student at the time, and I were talking about the fact that um, we needed to figure out how to bring people together who were doing work around um, prisons, thinking that uh, we would have a conference of about two or 300, maybe 400 at the most. And of course, uh, the rest is history. Uh, but um, the, the point that I was going to make is that we were we were uh, seeking to create um, um, a, kind, a poster, um, you know, maybe some kind of a logo, an image that would be used to publicize uh, the conference. And um, in the organizing of the conference, everything was uh, done democratically. We had, um, we had unending conversations, including about what this image might be. And of course, uh, some people said we need, you know, chains and bars, and this is always our visual shortcut that evokes uh, prisons. And and I can remember, uh, as a matter of fact, when my opening statement to the jury many many years ago was circulated in a pamphlet uh, in 1971 or 72, whenever it was, there was a picture of me on the cover of the pamphlet and bars. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that everybody knew that. Uh, and um, I think we had one of our first important philosophical conversations among the organizers uh, uh, about uh, these uh, chains and bars, which make people assume that they already understand what it is we're trying to convey. But of course, we wanted to produce the opposite effect. We wanted to urge people to think more deep, deeply and to to, re to recognize um, uh, that there are so many aspects of incarceration that we know little or nothing about it. So the question was how to constitute it as a new issue. And um, of course we decided eventually to ask an artist to help us with this, who came up with this uh, amazing uh, painting uh, uh, of an eye, uh, uh, which, uh, probably stopped more people in their tracks when they saw these posters in the streets and in institutions than if they had seen some chains or, uh, 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 or bars. Um, and, um, you know, I was thinking maybe Gina could talk about uh, the role of um, the conversations that we had about visuality and carcerality in the research group uh, that I convened uh, at UCHRI in, I think it was 2000, it was, it was a critical resistance uh, research group. And as it turn, turns out, we spent a good amount of time focusing on issues of, of, of visuality. And Gina, do you wanna talk about that uh, for a moment? Ooh, well, that, there's a lot to say. Um, so yeah, we were a research group following the conference. We did uh, work together. I'm trying to think of who was involved then. It was Avery Gordon and Ruthie Gilmore and, and David Goldberg and who am I leaving out? Nancy Shepard Hughes and um, there were seven of us. So I think I've almost got everyone. And um, we were all in different fields and different areas and trying to figure out how we could collaborate. And so one of the things that we recognized at that time was what it would mean to try and study the entire history of writing about the prison. And so, you know, we have somebody in anthropology, we had somebody in 
philosophy, we had, you know, two people in philosophy, we had, you know, people in different fields. Um, but we also realized that, um, that we had a visual history. And so my, my, my role then was actually to do screenings for us every week um, of the history of prison film. And I concentrated for reasons that I pointed out earlier, largely on um, the fictional films, because I wanted to understand what the relationship was, was between state power, uh, studio production, and, uh, and screening of those uh, things over time and how they had consolidated our relationship to the prison system. So I, I think for all of us, it was a really productive time to sit with those early films and, uh, and to talk about them, to talk about what kinds of tropes uh, had been established and what kinds of uh, conventions we had received and then where they, they began and then what those things were doing to the way we saw because the other part of what we were doing on that uh, in that research group was we were visiting prisons in California together as researchers and and of course when you visit a prison and you're not uh, currently incarcerated and you're not an attorney the way you visit um, well the way you visit for anyone is at the discretion of the what they call staff. Uh, and so the guards that were taking us around were going to restrict, of course, our access to many things. The things we always asked to see were the art making spaces, the library and the health facilities. There were things that were going to be hidden from us. And that was pretty interesting to think about why that would be. So we, um, we had meetings. We wanted always to meet with people inside um, and but how do you structure those meetings to have conversations that you can have in front of guards? How do you have a conversation that isn't about, well, what did you do to get here? And what are the circumstances of your life that we can help with? Because we're researchers coming in for one day visit. We can, are not in a position to do anything to help in individual cases. But what we wanted to do was make it clear that we're part of an abolitionist movement and that people inside are part of that movement with us and have in fact been the originators of that movement. And so having those conversations and some of those conversations, I tried to gear to things about how they had understood um, images of incarceration before they were jailed or imprisoned and what that did to their own relationship to being inside. And it was, I think those conversations were really powerful because when we're talking, people started to realize how much those images still clung to their own uh, narrations of their experience. So, you know, it's part of what Angela was saying before about the philosophical tradition that we come from, which allows us to understand how that could happen. That experience alone does not liberate us. Mm -hmm. um, and that in order to be able to see as abolitionists, we have to all be working together. And, you know, I'm just remembering, um... I, I'm just, just re can, can people hear me? Okay, I'm just remembering that um, I interviewed um, large numbers of women in prison yeah. in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And the way in which they interpreted their experiences as prisoners was through uh, US films and television shows that featured uh, a prison. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's such an amazing point because it is, it's about how, how, our, how we perceive the world is structured through images. But I was also thinking when we were talking about the kind of net, the images that also the critical resistance eye and the images that actually were not used are not always useful, right? This kind of insights, but there's moments, right? Where an image of violence actually pushes people into the street. I and mean, we've seen that repeatedly in the last, you know, six years right? These images where all of a sudden something strips down. So I was wondering about those moments where the same images can be used to keep the violent systems in place, but also provide the openings. Because I think this is the complicated thing about abolitionist aesthetics, is even some of the images that we worry could reinscribe the systems actually also can work with it to provide these openings. Yeah. Um... Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, that um, that we can't underestimate the actual, you know, on the ground, activist, intellectual, artistic labor that created new contexts 
for these images. Uh, uh, when, um, when George Floyd was uh, murdered by the police and we all got to uh, be witnesses, uh, 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 I thought of that as being a part of a of 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 of, uh, of a of a lynching that we were we, we were forced to be spectators as at a lynching and in a sense I think that uh, the vast numbers of people who witnessed that uh, image uh, all over the country and of course all over the world but here in the U.S. there was a sense in which the history suddenly uh, became palpable. Uh, and that, uh, that there was this recognition that if we don't go out in the streets now, uh, regardless of how dangerous it might be, the raging pandemic, that we will never have this opportunity to engage with history in, in the same way. Yeah, and you're reminding me, there's just so many events coming up and I, it's, uh, but I, I do wanna say in particular, something about Aaron Gray's work, just because you're, you're talking about um, the way in which we are interpolated into this um, lynching scene. And, um, you know, Aaron Gray, who works on this very issue, is, is going to be speaking in the series uh, before long. And I would love actually to have the time to talk about so many of the artists in the exhibition and the actual pieces. And I, I know we don't have the time tonight, but I do want to say I'm looking forward to tomorrow night, Rachel, when you and Alexander Moore do the curator's talk for the Cezanne Gallery. And I, I hope people will tune in because. Um, these short Zooms don't let us really dwell uh, in spaces uh, to really talk about the pieces, but it's very important for us to be able to do that. And since we're all having to do it virtually, you all will be our guides in, in doing that tomorrow night. So just letting everyone know. Yes, I mean, it, it is so interesting because a lot of times what art, the artists are working with are exactly the history, the these images from histories and the, uh, how the histories perpetuated that are I mean, they're almost, you know, they're, they're almost like hot to touch. They're so charged, right? And that they can be deployed in all sorts of manners. They can be deployed to, to keep the systems in place, to garner fear and all, all of that, or they can be used in these other ways. I thought that, that maybe, you know, Angela, you mentioned the kind of, or actually it was you, Gina, right? That mentioned um, feminist methodologies and abolitionist aesthetics. So I wondered if you'd both talk a little bit more about that and pull that out for us, particularly I, around how I think that rape and sexual violence and domestic um, violence has been kind of a central image and trope that's actually held the prison industrial complex together. Yeah, um, I guess I would begin by saying that it is becoming increasingly evident that feminism without abolition can so easily steer us in unproductive uh, uh, carceral directions, uh, thus carceral feminism. Uh, and the flawed assumption um, that all we need to do is declare gender violence a crime like any other crime, which is what the Violence Against Women Act uh, did, uh, uh, is, um, is in, in, in part responsible of, of, uh, for uh, a kind of legitimation of uh, the prison industrial complex. Uh, but then abolition without feminism can steer us in a masculinist direction and cause us to assume that because the vast majority of people in prison are men, um, or the majority of people who are attacked by the police are men, that we should only focus on men. Um, and, and of course, these positions also fail to reveal to us the, um, the emancipatory work that trans activists have done in demanding that, that we give up and subvert and jettison uh, and abolish binary notions of gender. Uh, uh, and in, in, in talking about um, abolition feminism, um, <laughs> we, all, we always have to center global capitalism. And in our conversation thus far, we haven't really uh, moved in that direction. And, and I, I don't think we can conclude without uh, 
acknowledging that it is racial capitalism that has brought us thus far, uh, that uh, 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 the, the damage the, and the pain and the suffering that is created by um, the prison industrial complex, by, uh, by, by uh, these racist structures of, of policing are ultimately connected to um, capitalism. So if we had another hour or so, uh, we would have a more extensive uh, conversation about what it means to do work in this context. Uh, uh, because it's not just that global capitalism, racial capitalism has helped to generate uh, uh, these problems. It also provides the context within which we uh, develop our resistance uh, and the context within which artists uh, uh, do their work, uh, uh, particularly artists who are connected to, you know, the, the art world. Um, and um, and so I think artists can, can help us uh, to understand how to work with those contradictions, how to, how to do important work on a terrain uh, that is basically uh, uh, constructed uh, by this um, um, exploitative, uh, uh, misogynist, heteropatriarchal uh, uh, system of racial capitalism. There's so much to say on that, but I, I think that the problem that we have about talking about racial capitalism is similar to the problem of prisons, and of course they're linked, in the sense that these are such abstract concepts for people to really understand. And part of the ways that I think academics in certain fields, definitely, and even those of us in cultural studies often explain those concepts doesn't necessarily make them easier to grasp. People can certainly feel the effects of these things in their lives. And if we uh, specify all the ways in which capitalism is, is um, injuring us, people are able to do that at the local level. But the larger um, community of those who were organized to combat global capitalism, as we know, has um, fallen away. And so we have more localized and um, divided and separated different struggles. So I, I think one of the important things for us always is really to think about um, different parts of the world where um, we're engaged and try to be connected and to think about, in particular, we spend a lot of time in Brazil and working with people in Brazil and thinking about um, so many of the similar um, circumstances that they are enduring on a daily basis, which is why um, uh, movement for Black Lives and BLM have been so important in places like Brazil. And we could really talk about that so much more. But one of the reasons to raise that now is to say that the Black women's struggle in Brazil has really been at the center of the resistance nationally, partly to Bolsonaro, but also to um, so much of what has happened. And um, artwork has been, uh, in the Brazilian context, very key to um, figuring out how to represent the resistance. I think um, our, you know, one of the things that I'm often concerned with is the way that those of us in cultural studies uh, describe what our problems are and sometimes fall into habits of description that turn artworks into things that can be the forms of information that are more acceptable and valued in our institutions. So we, short version, scientize everything uh, and turn it into information that can, can be conveyed that way. But unfortunately, um, I think that has degraded our ability to actually really um, interpret differently. And so lifting up and building up the parts of our communities that are engaged in really serious art practice and learning to be in conversation with that art practice, I think is really important also to our um, connecting to other parts of the world and not understanding things only in terms of whether or not it's a problem of the minority or a problem of the majority. Um, I'm thinking back to what Angela was saying about, um, you know, focusing, not focusing on women in prison because there are fewer. You know, a lot of times scholars also kind of follow that direction and sometimes we have to really work back and think, well, what does that do to our analysis? And feminism is really key 
to, to reminding us all the time about the need to attend to that which has disappeared. I think, I mean, the, there's kind of three things that you can put out onto the table that I think are all super interesting. I mean, the ideas of racial capitalism, the ways in which art is both entangled within it, but also can show its workings, mm -hmm. I think is incredibly interesting. The way that it's both participating in it and then also drawing connections between struggles. Mm -hmm. So I wonder about that because there's a ways in which what I worry about in this country is the focus on prisons, all of that, we in this moment in time is getting incredibly myopic that we are looking at the United States, all of our media is always about the United States, what's happening in the governments right now. And we actually are having a harder time, I think, visualizing the kind of web that this is happening in because the federal government is very much dominating the moment. So I think that, can we talk a little bit more about that with the kind of importance of this global solidarities of linking struggles, all of, I mean, I know it's a huge topic, but. Yes, and we're going to go on forever. I know Angela must have lots to say on this. I just want to say one little thing, which is um, the difficulty that that I think many of us have had with the turn to facts, right? On the one hand, we're in an environment where um, there is um, so much gratuitous lying about everything and intentional misrepresentation. But I think our uh, too immediate turn to claim uh, facts and security with the sense of, of what is factual is um, damaging to us. And it's actually something that those of us in cultural studies and, and of course artists have always been um, pointing us um, away from. So I, I think that we are hoping um, through thinking through the exhibition and with the series really to, to try to weigh in how can we both uh, express the seriousness of what's going on, but express it in such a way that we're not actually further consolidating this fact discourse, which is part of what makes it very difficult for us to move um, differently and to think differently. And there's a lot more to say about that, but I, I know Angela wants to get in here, I'm sure. Uh, well, Rachel uh, raised the, the, the question of, um, of um, looking beyond the national borders of, of the U.S. Uh, and, and I want to first respond by saying that um, in the very beginning, uh, when, um, when some of us began to raise these issues of, of prison evolution and people thought we were absolutely insane, uh, uh, how can we possibly think of getting rid of that which guarantees safety and security to the entire popul population? Of course, now we're at a di very different point and, and, and this would not have occurred uh, without the, the activism, um, the intellectual labor, the, um, the organizing labor, the artistic labor. Um, um, uh, but I think that um, it's 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 important um, now uh, to uh, think more capaciously about the meaning of the nation state, uh, and to recognize that um, these borders will not be with us forever. It's not a permanent arrangement. It, the nation state was produced in history uh, under conditions of bourgeois capitalism. Uh, and so it, it, it's, it's our responsibility to try to imagine something beyond uh, the nation state and not to assume uh, that within uh, the, this area that we call the US, it hasn't really been called the United States very long. Let's, let's, let, let's not forget that. And, and, and uh, the, the, the colonialism that had such a devastating uh, impact on indigenous, uh, on the indigenous people who were the first people uh, of this country should cause us to, um, to, to uh, focus less myopically on uh, the meaning of the United States of America. So I, I want us to also engage in a process of imagining what a world might look like without borders. Uh, uh, and this means, of course, that we include in our abolitionist strategies with respect to police and prisons, ICE 
and detention, um, immigrant detention facilities. That is so essential at, at this moment. At the same time, we recognize that, that we have a great deal to learn from other places. Uh, uh, and uh, right now we're involved in this public conversation about the meaning of uh, institutional racism, the meaning of, of, of structural and systemic racism. The best example of the, uh, of the structural character of racism can perhaps be found in South Africa. You know, why is it that um, even in the aftermath of the uh, abolition of the apartheid state, the police still engage in exactly the same kind of behavior as they engaged in before. And as a matter of fact, the uh, 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 police killing of uh, a young man, I can't remember his name, who had Down syndrome, a major case in South Africa. Uh, all of the actors in that event were black. Uh, and, and so uh, for those who argue that, well, we need some better police, you know, maybe what we need is black police in black communities or, or uh, uh, we need um, Latinx police in Latinx uh, and, 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 and that can, can, um, sh uh, that can have a, a devastating effect on our ability uh, to organize the, those very simplistic notions that all you need to do is change the individuals. Um, uh, and we see this so much more clearly if we look beyond our borders. Uh, so I'm actually uh, thinking that we need to figure out how to create a robust internationalism now. And we have the capacity to do this uh, uh, with, um, with, with all of the existing technologies. Uh, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about that, but I'd better be quiet because I think uh, we're already over time. But thank you so much, Rachel, for posing that question. Well, and I mean, I think that I agree with you is what I will say with that. I think that that's one of the most exciting things is that how do we connect the struggles so that we can see better the struggles that we are in. And I thank you for that. You know, I do want to ask one more question because it's one that, and it can be fast, Angela, but the one of the questions that I think that I've thought about a whole lot is that your relationship to images in the ways in which uh, you yourself have met, has functioned as an image. I mean, I think that the summer after I took a class with you, I saw five art exhibitions that showed your picture in it, or not pictures, right? It's like screen prints, something that referred to you. And I thought how funny it is to operate within, to be like a person and yet also an image. Well, I'm the person, I'm not the image. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I had to, um, I had to try to reconcile myself to the proliferation of images about myself. And, you know, it's so interesting because after my trial was over way back in, in um, 1972, um, uh, when probably uh, the, so many of the people watching uh, uh, on this call were not yet born. Uh, but I assume that the images would recede uh, shortly after the trial ended. I assume the movement would take on other issues. I mean, this is what I wanted, uh, uh, but I've had to uh, sort of cohabit uh, with all of these, these images uh, that um, I've um, eventually come to recognize that they're not really images of me. And I don't relate to them as images of myself. I relate to them as images uh, that stand in uh, for movements. Uh, and so I feel so much more comfortable with the images now than I once did. I, they used to embarrass me. Uh, you, you know, I, 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 I guess I, I felt as if I, I'm here and I'm there. And, uh, but anyway, I, I, I now recognize them as images uh, that convey and stand in for movements and collective power. And uh, I think one of the reasons they persisted for so long, um, and this has absolutely nothing to do with me and absolutely nothing to do with anything I've done as an individual, is precisely because uh, they uh, represent the power and, and the strength and the um, capacities and the potentials of people uh, united when they come together and struggle for justice and equality and freedom. 
And I guess I um, watched the webinar that you did with Jamal Jamaf in Palestine in uh, late August, which was one of the most amazing. I, it was one of those wonderful moments of this that we got to do that and then we get to see it. And one of the things that both of you kept saying was that every time you see struggle, you're seeing hope. And I always think that in some ways that, that in, the image, right, the transformation of the image, but also artworks about this are also about hope, right? They're always working towards that. So we've gotten a bunch of really wonderful questions from the outside, from the outside of this, <laughs> our closed little <laughs> Zoom world. And one of them I actually thought, you know, because Gina, when you were talking about facts and the ways in which facts have been mobilized, actually one of the questions, you know, that the this is a question that very much resonates with what's happening right now in our government. Mm. And one of the questions we got right away was the kind of the creation of propaganda as art and also the current campaign and what's happening in the federal government and the use of kind of different notions of facts, truths, social realities and how they're created. So, you know, this, as we're embracing these forms of creativity, yes. we are not the only ones we could say. Well, and Again, being brief about these things in these times, I mean, we all we're all we're all obsessed with this all day long. So let's just say that the question already tells us um, part of the answer for sure. That that um, we have a problem because um, those on the right have certainly studied um, a lot of the tactics that have been used uh, historically. Um, and uh, by the left, but, and I, I think that we, for that reason alone, we have to make sure that part of the political education that we want people to have is an aesthetic education. And that doesn't mean, and this is what's really hard about it. It doesn't mean having people be able to name artists in the year that they did some work, right? We, this kind of calculating, um, way of delivering the information, but rather give people some, some capacity to feel that they can work with and think with these images and also to have a transformation in the way that that happens. So that's something that we absolutely have to work on. And, and we, we're often asking technology to do it for us or the you know, Silicon Valley to sort of take down what is not factual. Um, and and I, I will say that as much as that is happening, we also have the capacity to use humor and satire and all kinds of other things to combat it that emerge on the internet. I'm not much of a social media person, um, but I do want to, on a more serious note, pick up on something Angela said earlier, because it really shouldn't be forgotten here. Um, I don't wanna do a, a battle about who's more oppressed, but I would say visually, We've presented the problem of the prison in the United States as being a black problem, a problem of mass incarceration extended from slavery. And so often when I'm teaching, I really talk about the hyper incarceration of indigenous people and the way that and why we don't see that. And some part of that has to do with the structuring of the prison system itself. So the fact that we have jails in Indian country and federal prisons and that those statistics are kept separately from other kinds of statistics that are more um, state-based and um, in um, our local metropolis. So um, I, I wanna say that not because I wanna say, well, then it's really more important to pay attention to indigenous people. It's just to point out how we tend to fall into these patterns and create these competitions over ideas in ways that are not helpful. And so I've actually been really thinking about the fact that Rachel, we, we were talking about the erasures um, in the uh, prison abolitionist kind of uh, set of images that are being created and wanting the series to be focusing on that. And so I wanted to say that now because I think people can look forward to people who are experts in some of these areas who will help us to, to um, enlarge in, um, the way in which we uh, imagine these questions. I think there's another really good question, I think that kind of goes along with it. And I'm just, because they're all coming up on my side too about Kant and the kind of, and um, the relationship with Kant and Berger and Luckman, which were, were completely kind of circling around in the social construction of reality. So I think, Angela, people would like you to talk about this just a little bit more. <laughs> 
Um, well, um, you know, I was emphasizing um, aesthetics and um, thinking about Kant's third critique, uh, uh, which uh, tries to address um, the um, schism that exists between um, uh, practical reason or moral um, um, capacity and, uh, and um, um, pure reason and the um, practice of understanding. I'm, I'm trying not to use technical terms here because I know uh, 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 people may not be that interested in, in all of that. But, um, but I, I, I find it a really fascinating, not uh, simply for the purpose of understanding uh, the experience of art, uh, uh, but, but also uh, about the role of the imagination. Uh, and um, and and I think Gina was talking about uh, the um, uh, talking about aesthetic education, and of course Gaetri Spivak emphasizes the importance of educating the imagination, uh, um, aesthetic education, which is something that um, rarely occurs in our educational system, uh, uh, um, and. So I, you know, I, I'm not sure how to summarize a vast topic like that or speak about it in ten words or less. Uh, but 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 I will say that uh, uh, the emphasis on the imagination, especially now, uh, I was scrolling through the questions and saw a question about the lack of um, imagination in our politics. Uh, uh, and the ways in which the political discourse is so lacking in any way of, of thinking critically about uh, about the world and thinking about about the future, uh, and this focus on a kind of positivistic engagement uh, with that which exists uh, 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 is um, one of the reasons there are two point you know, 4 million people behind bars uh, today, both in terms of uh, the, the, the ways in which they have not, the people who are incarcerated have not necessarily been given uh, the tools with which to imagine life, to imagine the future. And so many people who go to prison end up spending that time learning, learning how to read, learning how to write. Um, and engaging uh, with art. And Nicole Fleetwood's uh, 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 um, catalog is so amazing. Uh, you see all of these examples of people who came to art very late uh, and it became a lifeline. It became uh, the ways in which they um, uh, created a world for themselves that allowed them to survive under those uh, impossible conditions of repression. That one of the things, you know, one of the questions that came up really early was actually from a high school junior who was asking about saying that they're, you know, really concerned with the issues of racial discrimination and how it's tangled into prisons and wondering about the kind of concrete actions they can take in their lives. I think that actually the, the question of imagination, right, it really gets us to here too. But what do you tell people who say, what are they supposed to do? Or what are the, action, what are the, the kind of guide points you give people? Well, well, Jeannie can answer this question also, but uh, um, if I, you know, I don't necessarily like to give advice. Uh, but if I'm asked, uh, my my first impulse is to talk about uh, uh, being, uh, creating community uh, uh, in this country because of the impact of um, uh, neoliberalism, especially we think from the outset as individuals. So we think only about what I can do as an individual. And that's very little actually. Uh, and, and so I would suggest that uh, uh, people who want to bring about change join some kind of collective, become a part of a community. Uh, uh, right now there's a, a, a beautiful proliferation of, of, uh, of um, of educational programs that have been uh, created uh, 
sometimes by universities, uh, especially in the aftermath of the disestablishment of all of the educational programs that happened as a result of the 1994 crime uh, bill. Um, and, um, and figure out how you can go into a prison and, and contribute. If you're an artist, you can teach art. Uh, you know, if you are, um, if you are involved with theater, you can do theater in prison. Uh, you can, I mean, I, the first time I taught in prison, it was such an enlightening experience when I taught at the San Francisco County Jail and it opened, I think I learned much more than I um, shared with the, the women who were there. So there are multiple ways in, in which to become active and to make a direct intervention uh, around these issues. And not to belabor this, but since you pointed this out and since happily we have someone who's a junior in high school listening, um, I think that's amazing. We, um, we, we often talk about people doing things from where they are. And I think that can be really helpful. One of the things that I find now when I speak to younger people and I'm teaching is that there's a lot of anxiety about trying to do everything and be everywhere and be every kind of person. And it's not very conducive, it's conducive more to anxiety than it is to actually feeling that you're participating in a substantial way. And this is why it's so important for us to be focusing on artists. I mean, these all the people in this exhibition have been working in the art world for a long time. And, and for some of them, this kind of work is a substantial part of their history of art making practice, but others evolved into it. And I'm sure they all started somewhere else. And so it's really important to think about what difference you can make in, in the places we don't think about. And, and going back to critical resistance, I feel like I learned so many lessons from that process. You know, we were talking about nurses and doctors and um, school teachers and, and all kinds of people who were at that conference. And, and the point was not to say, be a historian now or be someone who's running an organization necessarily, but really about um, figuring out what it is that you feel capable of doing, joining a collective so that you're not trying to do all of the parts of it yourself and, um, and, and realizing that, you know, it's not about trying to seek fame or glory. And that, as Angela often points out, uh, a lot of this change won't necessarily happen in your lifetime. I think we're lucky to be witnessing the extent of the change now, although we're living under some seriously repressive conditions, um, occasioned perhaps by all of our activity. So um, how we move through to the next phase is going to be really important, but it's gonna need people to be able to dwell um, in the places where they feel most useful and comfortable. I think that one of the things that I know that a lot of people want to know, you know, you see people and they're like, but we need something to tether a vision to. So mm -hmm. are there examples that you can think of, of um, visions, not just in art, but other systems that give us a place to start thinking about the, how we can work towards the abolitionist future that I think we're well embarked on, right, at this point? These are not well, short answer questions. You know, we always want to see evidence that it's possible, right? <laughs> they do. They want to know what the examples are to look at. Yeah. yeah, and 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 you know, sometimes we can be inspired when we see a, su a successful effort at uh, creating an alternative. Uh, you know, when we see Susan uh, uh, Burden and and the amazing work that she's done uh, to. Um, uh, guarantee that women who get out of prison uh, not only have a place to live, but can forge um, their their own futures. Uh, there are so many examples, um, but at the same time, I, I I think we we can't rely on what exists now uh, in order to um, envision a, a, a very different uh, future. I always. You know, I, 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 I always think back to and try to imagine how someone who was enslaved, who was fighting for freedom, imagined freedom. Uh, and um, of course, um, they could never have imagined what we are experiencing now. Uh, but because of the work that they did then, uh, we are able to inhabit uh, uh, these relative terrains of freedom and we're able to uh, push uh, for 
um, greater expanses of freedom today. Um, um, and so, yeah, let's find the examples, but, but at the same time, let's recognize that sometimes um, uh, we go where um, no one has tread before. And I know I'm taking a Star Trek. Uh, Which she loves, <laughs> by the way, anyway. <laughs> but, I, I, but just to say, you know, because that is it's a very serious question. It's just, we don't have time for the most serious answer, but I, I wanna say that there are a number of different events that are gonna be happening in the series where some of that will be talked about more extensively. And I think specifically because we've been talking about the domestic violence movement, um, the, the session on abolition and feminisms you know, is really partly engaged with that. What are the things that people are doing as alternatives right now and have been doing, right? And what are the ways that we can actually allow people to know more about those so that they can be spread and people can share those practices. So we need to understand that uh, we're, you know, just like we're having this conversation and things are going on. Uh, I'm sure if I turn the news on right now, I, I, I could get in a whole different conversation but we are in those spaces and can um, continue to uh, practice differently in our, in our local spaces. And that's, that's the work of abolition that's been ongoing. I think that one of the things that I always tell my students too is that anytime you respond to somebody in duress without calling the police you're working with in the space of abolition, anytime you respond to you know, anything with care instead of punishment, you're working from the space of abolition. So you can also begin to think in these really micro senses of what your responses are and that if you're, you can be in that space. Um, I think that some people have questions too about the, well, the role of the arts within prisons, right? So how, what do you think about art programs within prisons? Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, in our exhibition, we're showing artists who are working outside of prisons right. who have not been incarcerated. Right. We are also showing artists who are um, formerly incarcerated and we are working on a collaborative project with somebody who is currently on death row in uh, Tim Young, I'll say his name again, who's always with us um, in San Quentin. But this idea of these kind of different perspectives, I mean, Nicole's wonderful mm -hmm. exhibition up at MoMA really highlights the artworks of people inside, but we've actually taken a, a kind of slightly different route. So do you wanna, somebody, people wanna know about that and think about it and what, how you feel about that want to know about um, showing work from from people who are professional artists and not currently incarcerated? Yes. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I, I think it just comes back to another abolitionist principle. You just said, you know, if you're if you're um, caring for people and you're not, you know, um, treating them violently, the, the opposite is also true. If we're talking about abolition and we're doing a lot of canceling each other and violence to each other, we're probably not living up to what it is that we ostensibly are speaking about. So I think that um, what I hope that this whole um, experience of the year is really about is folding in all of these different kinds of work. It's why Nicole's work is so important. It's why it's why um, working with Tim Young is so important. It's why Jackie Summel's work, uh, working with Harmon Mollis. I mean, all of these um, are part of building a large swath of, um, of practices that are going to not work in the same ways. And if we continue to regulate each other, then to me, that feels very reminiscent of the structure that we're trying to fight. Yeah, and, and, and let, let me say that um, um, the, one of the feminist dimensions of abolition is precisely um, the, um, um, the, the recognition of knowledge that is not segregated uh, from feelings. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, what, what, what does it mean to be an abolitionist calling for the abolition of institutions, but internalizing those impulses and, and allowing those Im Im impulses to define one's relations to others? Uh, uh, so, you know, what does it mean to call for an end to retributive uh, punishment and at the same time uh, uh, have retributive impulses that define how one relates to someone who has done harm uh, uh, in, in the, even in the context of a, a personal relationship. So there's a kind of 
there's a kind of um, prefiguring quality of evolution that mm -hmm. asks us to imagine uh, uh, what it would be like to inhabit a different kind of world and to work on ourselves as we work on producing uh, that, that world. And that's, that's very exciting. And that is why artists are so important here because artists can help us um, feel uh, uh, what we don't yet know how to articulate uh, uh, in, in, in words. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's also a process that can bring us pleasure and joy so that we don't have to think about struggle as uh, being you know, always about sacrifice. Uh, uh, and this is why art is so essential to our capacity uh, to build movements and, and move forward and experience collective pleasure in the process. So there are so many more questions, of course, and we did not even get to a fraction of them. And thank you so much for everybody for participating in this conversation. And thank you so much, Angela and Gina, for giving us so much to think about. I mean, I'm really excited about all the events that are coming forward. We've got Brian Stevenson coming next week and he'll be in conversation with Gina, really thinking about his work with the Equal Justice Initiative and then also his work starting a museum in Montgomery, Alabama. I mean, I think the combination of being a lawyer and also seeing the role of visual culture and art is bound to help us really think about these things and the pleasures of this evening are not entirely over because we still get to watch all of Terry Lynn Carrington and Lisa Fisher's Us and We, the music video. So I'm really excited that we get to do that. I hope everybody comes um, next week to see the next conversation. I also wanna say that barringfreedom.org is now live. The graduate, my, my lovely graduate students who've been working so, so hard. This event will be archived there. All the events that were taking place are the music videos are also there. And you can also get much more familiar with the exhibition if you're unable to get to San Jose Museum of Art to see it. So check out the website. Thank you all so much. And let's enjoy this next video.
Thank you everyone so much. And thank you so much, Gina and Angela for that fantastic conversation. It's really exciting. We hope to see everybody next week.